we're trying to encourage critical thinking and intellectual stimulation because we're kind, most of us are spend our time behind screens and on social media. And social media has these things called algorithms where it strategically just pairs you with people and clips that, that they think that you like and you agree with. And so what that does is that that puts you in a, a digital eco chamber where you're just around people that think like you, talk like you. And what happens is it caricatures people that disagree with you. And so, you know, it, 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 it labels, you know, liberal people as, you know, free huggers, radicals, crazy woke people. And it labels, you know, MAGA Trump supporters as, as all of them being white supremacists and horrible people. And the truth of the matter is, is that they're, they're good and bad, bad people on both sides of the political spectrum. And in order for our democracy to, to be stable, I mean, we're going to have to go back to, we're going to have to veer back to a place where we don't hate one another, but we just disagree with one another. Because the truth of the matter is, is that we all, we all want the same things. We want a good life. We want great kids. We want safe schools. But we disagree on the direction that we should go to get there. So with further ado, I'd like to introduce um, the moderator for today's event, Mr. Brandon Bryce. He's the director of uh, philanthropy at uh, United Way. <clears throat> So I'm going to turn it over to him. So on behalf of the Wilmington Library staff, welcome to Chopping It Up with Judge Joe Brown and Michael Eric Dyson. Thank you, Jamar. Oh, thank you, Jamar. I'm a pretty loud speaker. How's everyone this evening? Are you ready? Are you ready? All right. Like we say, let's get ready to rumble. Let's do it. Ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the main event. All right, folks, without further ado, ah, let it go. Bring it down. In the ring. Let's get ready to rumble. At 6 1. The one, the only, Michael Eric Dyson. Y'all ready for this? <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, sir. And his opponent. All the way. From Washington, D.C., Judge Joe Brown! All right, folks, this is the Clash of the Titans. We're going to have a conversation and actually have what we call barbershop talk. That means real conversation, real news, and real dialogue this evening. All right, gentlemen, please take your seats. I have Judge Joe Brown on my right. Oh, gotcha. And I have <laughs> Dr. The man, the myth, you see him on MSNBC, you see him on all publications, Michael Eric Dyson. So, gentlemen, thank you. All right. So this is part of our Chopping It Up series. And we wanted, these were questions that came from the greater Wilmington area about how do we fix issues in the black community. All we ask is that you are honest, straight to the point, and keep it real. All right. First question. 
you know, it's unfortunate. We, and if you have heard, we've lost one of the Migos characters, uh, Takeoff, due to gun violence. My first question will go with you, D Dr. Dyson. What is the biggest issue impacting black males today? Well, first of all, it's uh, great to be here uh, with uh, Judge Joe Brown, a legendary and iconic figure uh, in our community and indeed in the nation. So it's uh, an honor to have this little tete-a-tete -tete and uh, <laughs> conversation with such a distinguished figure. Um, obviously, what's confronting young black men, lack of resources, lack of employment, lack of education, uh, the flooding of our communities, and indeed this nation with guns. Um, back in Judge Joe Brown's day, back in my day, there was a resolution of you know, uh, disagreement with fisticuffs. Sometimes in a dice game, you might get cut. But the, the rapid proliferation of access to guns has led to a devastating consequence for so many of our communities. So we can talk about the ethical and moral outlook that we should encourage, that most black communities encourage uh, upon our young people to take care of their self, themselves, to get educated, to do as best they can uh, in the culture. Uh, we, we go to church, we go to temple, we go to synagogue, we hear the moral lessons being encouraged upon us. But when I look at the devastating consequences of the hatred of the other, what used to be called black-on-black -black crime, people kill where they live. 93% of black people who are murdered are murdered by black people. 83% of white people who are murdered are murdered by white people. If you want integrated killing, have integrated communities. The truth is that there is lateral violence. And the violence expressed of one black person to another in intimate spaces where people are killing folk that they know or are familiar with. Because if you had a game, you at least got to be introduced to somebody. Um, and even if he's a victim of either friendly fire or incidental violence, the tragedy is that our communities are gutted. Uh, because of the devastation of the downward turn in the economy, the lack of access to resources, the failure uh, to understand the necessity of a certain kind of preparation that we take upon ourselves, and as well uh, the ways in which we have been discouraged from believing that our lives are worth something. That doesn't come out of the thin air. That doesn't absolve people of personal responsibility to address the situations in which they could discover themselves, but it's also a collective and institutional enterprise as well. Same question for you, Judge Joe Brown. What's the biggest issue impacting black males today? All right. Let me start off with a little example to explain it. Anybody in here afraid of me? No, you like me. But I've taken martial arts for 55 years, and there are not many adult humans I can't without a weapon very quickly but you're not worried about me because I have character I'm here to protect you not to hurt you we're seeing a lack of character in our community and across the United States because we are out of balance we need women and we need men but we have attempted to emasculate our communities and we have no fathers in the homes we have no fathers in the hood. We have no culture that is putting fatherhood out there so that the boys understand that they are to grow up and be men. And being a man, your job is to make where you live a better, safer, more secure place filled with economic prosperity, sense of purpose, morality, and ethics. You are men of public peace, dignity, and order who can be brave and courageous when necessary. And if we do not teach these young boys that, they grow up to be monsters because they're out of control. Now, as a pragmatic matter, I got elected to two eight-year terms as a criminal court judge in Tennessee. And over that time period I was in, the statewide recidivism rate for felons was 80%. In my courtroom, I dropped it down to 
Anybody that I put on bond, anybody that I put on probation, you had to deal with Judge Joe's counseling sessions. And I put manhood in their heads so when they looked in the mirror in the morning, they had a guiding factor. So whether it was shame, whether it was guilt, they would look at themselves in the mirror and say, did you do what you were supposed to do as a man yesterday? Are you going to do it today? Are you going to prepare to do it tomorrow? And they come up to me now, 30 years later, and they say, Judge, you remember me? Uh, no, sir. Well, you gave me some time. Did I give you enough? Uh, well, you know, it was that thing about manhood, and now I've got four children and six grandchildren and I teach them what you taught me and I've got 15 young men in the neighborhood that I'm trying to counsel so they become positive factors so when I do that I don't think it's all worthless and there's no purpose there is a reason and even if I'm not here tomorrow I did something to help the other people see the daylight at the end of the tunnel and I've become a hero. That is what I'm trying to do. We have to put character back in the hood. I passed the mic. <laughs> All right, Dr. Dyson, this question is for you. Uh, given the political climate today, before now, what efforts have been made individually and collectively by the Biden administration to understand what black America experiences today? Well, obviously, uh, the Biden administration has made certain strategic moves, certain substantive moves, uh, certain political moves, and certain legislative moves, right? So when you think about the fact that Biden committed to run with a black woman, right, the first in history, and then put a black woman on the Supreme Court who's already earning her keep, by asking penetrating questions, by being far more vocal than the black man who occupies that space. Right? When Judge Joe Brown talks about character, it ain't just in the hood, it's those who wear hoods. Right? And um, I, I think it's, it's critical that uh, Joe Biden's symbolic, right, symbolic in terms of black women in these kind of critical places are also symbolic gestures, although they have substantive impact, are also accompanied by uh, efforts to redress the economic inequity in the country. So when you see Republicans pushing back on right now the ability of black people to be able to, as other citizens, enjoy $20,000 of reparation, if you will, for student loans. The right wing is organized against that because it's not explicitly racially based, though it has racial consequence. They are arguing against that because it helps black people. Again, who could take a lesson, not only the Migos, but the right wing Republicans who refuse to acknowledge the systemic complicity and white supremacist orientation of their entire tradition, trajectory, and history against the betterment of the masses of people, including, by the way, poor and working class white folk, right? So they need character too, all right? Um, Joe Biden, in terms of trying to put forth, what, arguments about distribution of resources in terms of health care, trying to extend what has been called Obamacare to protect it, the Supreme Court so far surprising to many, including uh, Chief Justice Roberts, have protected uh, that particular uh, health care uh, mandate that has been translated into legislation that has helped millions of people uh, in our communities. The attempt to even reduce, and the judge and I were speaking about this earlier, uh, the disparity between powder and crack cocaine. We know it was significantly reduced, but it still needs to be reduced. And then the other day, uh, freeing all those people or insisting that they be freed who were put in jail for abusing some weed. Now again, right, we ain't trying to justify folks smoking weed because most of y'all in this room done smoked it. 
you just ain't got caught. So you go into church and acting like the Holy Ghost got you when you barely skated through on that sticky green. So at least I've, I've heard that. I've looked at Joe, Judge Joe's court and I've, I've seen that. I'm not sure. So the thing is, is that there are strategic deployments of messages to the black community, of substantive uh, messages to the black community, of substantive politics to the black community. Does there need to be more? Yes. We look at what happened with the IRA. The point is that the black farmers were left high and dry so that attorney Benjamin Crump is suing in order to get restored to them the reparative monies that were delivered to them, or at least promised to them, I should say, uh, because of the systemic inequities that farmers face. So yeah, there are a patchwork of legislation, of strategic and symbolic gestures. And let's be honest, when the judge speaks about character, he's right. Look at the orange apparition that beclouded the American horizon for four years and that continues to do so. Thank God Elon Musk didn't own Twitter then because he would be standing up every morning to excrete the feces of his moral depravity into a nation he's turned into a psychic commode. <laughs> so for me, it is both policy, it is practice, it is behavior, and it is tone that is set as well. To open ourselves to a white supremacist demagogue with crypto fascist impulses and neo authoritarian impulses needs to be held in check. So, even though he's an old white man that folks say is, you know, on the downswing, I disagree with that. He's an old white man doing what he does. We got Judge Joe Brown up here, 75 years old, and as sprightly as anybody up in this room. So I say, I love older people doing their thing. Let's keep this man in office a little bit longer to see what he gonna do. Judge Joe Brown, same question with you. Uh, the Biden administration, helping or hurting black America? Your thoughts? Let's put it this way. First off, I was a lifelong Democrat. Now I am an independent. I played football in high school in L.A. at Dorsey High and also at UCLA a long, long time ago. I remember I detested and despised our quarterback. I hated his guts, but I blocked for him because he delivered the passes that got the touchdowns made that got us to the championship. All right? Don't have to like somebody to go for them. Now, that said, I detest and despise the current president. Fifty-some years ago, I was down here in Dover doing research for a D.C. think tank that I was interning for. I heard a commotion outside, and I went out, and there was John B. Stennis. There was Eastland. There was Faubus, that's the guy that stood in the doorway of Little Rock High School and said those young, Negro, black, Afro-American, African-American, black students, some of whom I have met in life, were not going in there. Bird was there, and they were introducing the new up-and-coming Dixiecrats, and I, Dixiecrat, and I saw a young man with a duck tail looking back like he was back in 1950-something, said some of the most disgusting things I'd ever heard said about my people it's in the White House right now. Now, you have to look deeply at what is actually going on. Let's take the forgiveness of the student loan thing. Sounds good, except when you back off any place in the rest of the world that you had a four-year college degree, you would be firmly in the middle class. In the United States of America, the Labor Department has said the middle class makes if just one person 125000 a year, and that is the cutoff point for any relief under this thing with the student loans. So when they're giving you relief, that is a testimony that something is wrong here because you're not making what you ought to make with your education. Meanwhile, let's back off. Was it wholeheartedly done or is there another purpose involved? 
Well, if you are a bank or a financial institution, you no longer have to wait for these loans to be paid off in installments. You get all of your interest and a complete repayment on the obligation all at one time. You can discharge people in your loan collection departments. You don't have court costs and attorney fees to take people to court. You make a ball. Meanwhile, some people are happy, but their financial circumstances still haven't changed, and they're not in the middle class, even though they've got a four-year degree. Why is that? Because the country is not dealing with what it ought to deal with because computerization and industrial technology have made most working class people obsolete. So there are not enough jobs going around to enough people. So what we do is the same thing when we have a surplus in any kind of commodity, whether it is wheat, corn, cotton, or people, we do three things. We store the surplus. That's the jail cell instead of the grain silo. You have a subsidy of the would-be producer, that's the government check that people become too dependent upon. You pay the farmer ordinarily, say not to draw or grow soy, and you cut back production. Well, the farmer doesn't grow soy, but in our case, with all of the negatives on social media, entertainments, the kids bang out, drug out, drop out, get pregnant too early, too often, don't develop any vocational skills, any academic excellence, they have wrong ideation, they turn where they live into chaos-filled uh, areas, they just are unemployable, and when they get that first felony, then you don't have to worry about them. And why is that important? Because there's some guys, one of whom was named Timothy McVeigh, get real worked up and they go down and buy $250 worth of ammonium nitrate fertilizer, and they go blow up a courthouse in Oklahoma City and kill 240-some people. Well, they don't want that, so they come up with a safety valve. You have schoolhouse to jailhouse pipelines, and you put people who are in a position where there's surplus to the labor requirements in there, and everybody gets to talking about free to righteous brothers in the penitentiary, which that has some traction. But I know from 50 years in criminal law, you have 97 plus percent who pled guilty. They didn't get found guilty. Got 84 to 87 percent that confessed. Some people are not guilty. They're not guilty people. I got the youngest person in the world off death row. He was 15 years and two months when I got a stay of execution. 23 minutes before they were going to execute him in Arkansas. Now, yeah, there are things that happen, but we have to develop this character thing so we don't get people put in or robbing their neighbors, raping their neighbors, gangstering their neighbors, killing their neighbors, and trying to deal with a new thing, which is suicide by a neighbor rather than suicide by a cop and get themselves in a mess where we have to worry about where we go at night, when we go there at night, and now in the daytime. See, there are some things to be done, so don't worry about whether you like somebody. Just think of it as you're on a team, and even if you don't like your quarterback personally, you want him to throw that touchdown pass, and you block for him. Now... Speaking of education, uh, and I want to ask both of you this, this question. This came from the, from the audience. What are your thoughts? I'll start with you, uh, Dr. Dyson. What are your thoughts on critical race theory? Some say it's telling the truth on American history. Others say it's anti-American rhetoric. Your thoughts? Yeah, well, and, and I just want to amplify what the judge said. Character, again. You know, when you got your family to hook up in the White House as your advisors, when you're using American economy as an extension to bankroll your own practices and commodifying cultural consciousness and political practice to serve your own venal vicious ends, they ain't got no character. 
And you talk about white crime, white collar crime versus blue collar crime, and, and it's true. And the judge is absolutely right. Ain't nobody arguing. This is no brief in defense of thugs. But there are thugs everywhere. And the thugs have to be called out where they are. We know one group will be identified because what the judge is speaking about, the reason y'all amen in it, y'all believe that if you do the crime, you should do the time. Y'all believe that you shouldn't be, your community should not be rife with all kinds of moral pollution. But the other side, they claim they believe the same thing. January 6th proved they don't believe none of that. They don't believe no blue lives matter. They were devastating the police people on that day. They don't believe in the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, the Federalist Papers. They took a Confederate flag, the banner of disloyalty, and drug it through the United States Capitol, the very embodiment, symbolically speaking, of democratic practice, small d. And then imagine if a brother or sister fucking out had fucked up on that darn, put his feet up on Nancy Pelosi's desk. Oh, and by the way, the other day, somebody went to her crib. Speaking of thuggery, speaking of lack of character, the white supremacist crackerocracy, the rule, reign, and tyranny of white supremacist ideals, norms, and values, I'm talking specifically about that, show themselves to be bankrupt. So Juju and Jamal and them need to be held to account and the rest of these thugs need to be thrown in jail who work for us in American democracy. Now, to answer your point about education, um, critical race theory, and we, again, we have one of the most distinguished jurists in our nation sitting on this uh, platform here, right? Critical race theory is a legal theory invented first by Derrick Bell, right, who was working with James Meredith in Mississippi, and then became the first tenured law professor at Harvard University. And Kimberly Crenshaw, Gary Peller, Marie Matsuda, Charles Lawrence, right? It's a, you know, you would call it an egghead theory in the sense that us eggheads, philosophers and theoreticians and academicians, we up in the academy, we're coming up with very practical considerations that have theory at their base. And all critical race theory says, when it comes to thinking about institutional racism, don't think individuals, think institutions. It's not whether or not you call me the N-word, it's whether or not the tax base will determine who gets an education and who gets the best education. Or the tax base and the property base will determine the distribution of goods and resources for education. So you might have a 70, 80, 90 million dollar school out in the suburbs of Philadelphia or in Delaware and in the inner city barely running water with textbooks still second and third hand. So critical race theory is simply saying as a legal philosophy, let's think not individual but institution, not particular persons but systems in terms of the uh, force and function of inequality in America. They ain't teaching no fifth grade students no daggum CRT. These white folk for the most part and Negroes too who are against CRT wouldn't know the difference between CRT and OPP. <laughs> right? And so critical race theory, I've taught it for years. It's a philosophically dense, theoretically per, uh, propitious, very concentrated form of thought about the social structural inequities that prevail that disallow certain communities to inherit goods and services for which they pay their precious tax dollars. So CRT is critical and necessary, but what they're trying to be against is the, the teaching of history in general. If you look at Ron DeSantis, what he did when he signed that anti-CRT bill was saying what? We don't want white students to be uncomfortable. Guess what, homie? Discomfort is the basis of true education. Unless you hear a judge, Joe Brown, go against what you think is the commonsensical way, and he twisted with his homespun genius, you're going to get uncomfortable because he's spitting some truth into you that you don't want to deal with. But that will motivate you 
to think differently about your situation. We are not here to make you comfortable. We are here to tyrannize your comfort when it rests upon inequality and the refusal to acknowledge the humanity of the masses of people. So CRT ain't about darn trying to t make white folk guilty. It's about holding to account what the judge said. If it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. These lack of character having politicians who refuse to abide by the same principles that they live by. Let us have the same insurance you got up on Capitol Hill. Let the masses of American citizens enjoy those privileges. So for me, it's about anti-education. It's about, look, they love history except when it comes to us. 15,000 books on Abraham Lincoln. Books on, uh, books on even Aaron Burr, who as you know is, is, is uh, Raymond Burr's cousin. <laughs> All right, I just want to see if y'all knew Perry Mason. I'm just, I'm just saying, right? So the point is that critical race theory is a theory, a legal academic theory that got taken by a young white student graduated from Georgetown who when reading the anti-racist literature discerned the repetition of citation of critical race theory and said that will preach to the conservative firebrand. I can use that to manipulate the consciousness of poor people, of working class white people, and of ignorant people of history to make them believe that what they're trying to teach your kid is critical race theory. No, we're trying to teach them about democracy. We're trying to teach them about white supremacy and slavery. We're trying to teach them about the beauty and the power and the Beauty, the, the, the elegance of the country in which we live and some of the historical factors of the brutality and ugliness that we did at the same time. You can't love some history. Either you love history altogether or you don't love history at all. They reenact these Civil War battles. They dress up. They put all the costumes on. But one book about black slavery, oh my God, no. One book that talks about 1619, oh no. The point is, either you are deeply imbued with a historical consciousness and an appreciation for history, or you ain't. Gore Vidal had it right. We live in the United States of amnesia. And many of these folk believe that Barbara Streisand supplies the theme song, what's too painful to remember, we simply choose to forget. And if you don't like Barbara Streisand, Gladys Knight did a hell of a remix of that song too. <laughs> All right, all right. I want to segue the conversation. Uh, it was mentioned, Blue Lives Matter was mentioned, Judge Brown. I want to ask you, um, do you believe in the concept of defunding the police? How should policing be reformed today? Well, since I'm running for mayor of Memphis, I have a, an extensive and very detailed plan to do something about it. No, the police do not need to be defunded because crime is rampant everywhere, including in the black communities. What we do need is a total revision of the structure of the typical U.S. police department. Police department needs to be restructured like the U.S. Pentagon in the Department of Defense. You have a civilian commander-in-chief, that's the president, a civilian secretary of defense, one over the army, one over the navy, etc., etc., sub-secretaries who are civilians. We need the same thing. We don't need civil service chiefs of police. We need civilian directors. We need sub-directors over homicide, uniform patrol, sex crimes, property crimes, traffic, etc. We need direct communications input by the citizenry. You have a thing that you can see in good operation down in Detroit called Dads in Schools. And we need the same thing where we get the people in the community who are allowed to participate and go out in patrols regulated along with the police so they can say, young man, come here. What do you think you're doing? We need to talk with you. And we need to start putting the civilian context back in what's going on. And the other thing is, is that police, in my experience, have been a one-one reflection of the political realities in the area. If the 
police don't treat you like anything, your representation is not good. Examine the people that you have chosen to represent you because they're not doing their job. Now, all that being said, we don't need to defund the police, we need to revise what police are about. They are supposed to be protecting and serving us. And then several things you have to take into context in American law. It has been held by the U.S. Supreme Court and the federal appellate courts over and over again. The police have no obligation to protect anyone except those people they actually have in custody. If in the process of stopping criminal activity, they protect you, that's incidental because their primary business is to keep public peace, dignity, and order. So nobody's protecting you. Second Amendment is going out of the window sometimes. The police aren't there for you, so what are you supposed to do? That is a problem, and that's where we are right now. So somehow or another, along this line of thought, we have to say we have to take back our neighborhoods. They belong to us. Hey, we ought to be deeply ashamed that our children have run the parents and the adults out of their own houses. I'm not used to that. And I don't see why you should. Take control of where you live. We run off at the mouth all the time. Why don't you, by the way, go pull the coattail on your pastor? You say, Pastor, what's happened? I haven't heard you preach about sin and his wages in a long time. Somebody said, why don't you go to church much, Judge? I said, I haven't heard a sermon on sin and the wages in 30-some years. What are you doing? It's all about belief, not deeds. Well, somewhere along the line, somebody's got to say, oh, no, that's wrong. You can't do that. And I called a preacher two weeks ago. You know what he told me? Because we can't say that anymore. I said, why not? Because everybody would get up and walk out the congregation. Now, if you don't want to behave, if you don't want to hear about it, don't complain about it. A lot of things that need to be said are uncomfortable. A lot of things might sound good, but they're not good for you. What do we tell our children? Don't eat that candy. Why don't they eat the candy? Tastes good, but it rots their teeth. Gives them bad habits. Gets them hyper and acting like they've lost their little minds. So we need to do that with ourselves. <laughs> Enough of this feel-good candy. And whether you like somebody or not, let's do the cold-blooded calculus. I have one vote maybe can contribute to somebody's election. What do I get for that vote? You and yours get what you need? Or are you wanting and you look at somebody else getting a lot and you get nothing? And then basically, it's about some things. Public, peace, dignity, order. It's about decency. It's about honor. And it's about respect. Are we supporting somebody's policy where that's gone out the window? Or are we trying to say, I don't care. I don't like the quarterback, but I got a block for this guy because I want him to score a touchdown. Remember, I'm an independent. I don't care about anybody except what's effective. So, so Judge Brown, speaking of what's effective, let me ask you and then I'll, I'll come back to you, Dr. Dyson. Um, what are your thoughts on voter suppression? Uh, is it racist? Is it wrong to require people to have ID when they vote? No, it's not wrong to have ID. I represent, represented, ill acquainted with, with murderers, thieves, thugs, gangsters, and they all have driver's licenses. <laughs> 
I mean, you trying to thug out. I mean, you driving down the street, no license, you going straight to jail. So they have driver's licenses. It's just about every state, if you want to register to vote, you get it through the DMV. If you can get a driver's license, you can get a voter's registration card. That's specious. Now, next thing. Since 2008 in Shelby County until four or five months ago, the feds put up funds to replace every one of the corrupted, hacked voting machines we had in that county. The Justice Department under Bush, under Obama, under Trump, and under Biden say those machines are hopefully, hopelessly corrupted and you people haven't had a fair election since 2000. At one time, the Republican Party controlled that. Right now, it's the Democratic Party, and every single time it's come up resolution, let's use the federal money that they put up to replace these machines and get some fair ones, it has been voted down. And nobody's questioning. So who's doing what? See, everybody needs to be held to account. So when you have a system that plays fast and loose with you, that isn't truthful with you, and it's like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, um, it gets scary when our forums get controlled and somebody says this is private enterprise, we can control what you hear if we don't like it. Mm -mm. They have to broadcast. They impact commerce and communications interstate. So they should be public utilities. But since Musk took over Twitter, strangely, I picked up about 3,000 followers in two days. They'd been shadow blocking before. And now I just posted an article, a study that came out that said real life people <laughs> are actually checking out what you are doing and posting on these institutions and blocking them if they don't like it and it doesn't go with their agenda. There were supposed to be algorithms. Cut me off. My Mic check, mic check, mic check, please. Oh, oh my, I'll yell. Look All here. right. All right. In other words, that's because you hear it doesn't mean it. Want to find out something? Go look yourself. Go read a lot of things because what they put out there is not necessarily a truth. What the truth is, it is yourself. on the bottom and you keep them down there they get dissatisfied if your foundation is decayed it doesn't improve just because you put a new paint job on it you have to do something so everybody has a piece of this action everybody is provided with the resources to deal with self-help to deal with self-advancement to deal with providing for themselves and those that depend upon them. You have to deal with their character so they know who is depending upon them. You have to deal with what's in their heads so they are prepared to function in the 21st century. And then we can go someplace if we stop trying to keep somebody on the bottom. Now, be green for all I care, but if you got a good thing going on, I'll listen to you. 
Thank you. Pass the mic. Oh. <laughs> Still works. <laughs> All right, same question for you, Dr. Dyson. Again, voter suppression. Uh, should people be required to have IDs when they vote? Well, look, I want, first of all, I wanted to say what the judge said about uh, policing. It's so uh, refreshing to hear. Because even if you disagree about, you know, those who say defund the police, they got in mind what the judge is talking about. So at some level, it's terminological and it's about nomenclature, not about the substantive philosophy. Figure out ways to take money from over here and put it over there. When they talk about defunding, they're saying, we, look, they ain't going to get no problem with defunding the, the darn education system. They defunding that all the darn time, right? So what is it about the police? Only in a militaristic society where the law and order enforcement becomes primary in its needs, you know you're living in a fascist authoritarian country. So what's interesting about it, though, I love what he said about the civilian presence on these, you know, review boards and taking people to account. And the brilliant way in which he deconstructed that is so valuable because it used to be that community policing, like the judge said, you in the neighborhood, come here, Johnny, stop doing that. Come here, Shanae, stop doing that. When we had intimate relations where you lived, where you police. But the right wing especially don't believe you should live where you police. So the police that killed Freddie Gray came in from Delaware, went over to Baltimore, because it's not they cousin, they mama. When they're mistreating us, they don't see themselves in us, right? So we don't smell like them, talk like them, think like them, process like them, even though we just like you as human beings. So we see white people with machetes in their hand trying to kill police and they refuse to shoot them. You saw the video of a white cop running from a white boy. The white boy took his car and the white man with the gun was running up the hill. Can we get some of that? All right? That's what we're talking about at the end of the day. Character of these characters needs to be reformed in a fundamental way. Now, to answer your question about uh, about you know, uh, voter suppression, I, I think what the judge said is right. There is overwhelming evidence that there's voter suppression. And voter suppression is about local Republican legislators that gerrymander districts that cut them up and carve them up. And when you look at the distribution of Republicans and Democrats, the Republican-controlled state legislatures have changed the landscape of American politics because they're determining who goes to what district, who can get elected, who can be forced in, and who can be forced out. Voter suppression is real. Study after study has suggested that it's real. And I hear the judge is funny about the, that, that, that's a funny story about the, about the thugs having ID. Some of them, they done made it up, but that's all right. They, they got their ID, right? It's counterfeit, but they got their ID. Now, What's interesting is you can have a gun ID and register to vote, but a college ID, you're disqualified. Hold it now. I'm confused. It is a issued ID, right, that allows you. Now, we know it's about federally issued IDs and so on and so forth. A lot of folk can't afford them, believe it or not. A lot of folk can't afford to pay that money. Just because you can afford to pay that money, you would think, oh, my God, you can pay $30 and $40. A lot of folk can't do it. So they distribute uh, these, uh, the, the, the necessity for an ID law. Why, why wasn't it necessity when George Bush, number one, got in office? Or even George Bush, number two? Why was the law changed after that? The judge is right in terms of the timeline, 2008, 2004, before then. Why was it good enough for George Bush to get in but when Obama comes into play, there's a different set of principles and practices that are put forth. We ain't got to be no genius to understand that the right wing hunter in this country is using every measure and, and every stratagem possible to reintroduce poll taxes, to reintroduce literacy taxes. In other words, every particular strategy that will deny people access when the judge talks about what's going on in other countries in terms of, the, uh, in terms of getting money and $20,000 forgiven, first of all, most other countries got free education. 
You ain't got to worry about no damn student loan because you ain't got to pay for it in the beginning because your tax dollars already will supplement it. They do that in California, they do it in other places. So how about making education accessible to the masses? How about having a national holiday for voting? Why you got to be uh, taken off from your job because they not interested in everybody voting. They want fewer and fewer people to vote. The Republicans have admitted that. They've done studies where they've said, we don't want these people necessarily voting. It's too much access. I'm confused. I thought you were about democracy. No, you want your particular ideology to prevail. Study after study has shown the, the, the obvious and manifest injustice of the demand for voter ID laws and the voter ID laws popped up at a certain historical juncture in this country when the right wing seized power. It was all right for Nixon to get uh, uh, elected under that. It was all right for Gerald Ford to get elected under that. It was all right for Ronald Reagan to get elected under that. It was all right for George Bush number one to get elected from on that. In other words, for a whole bunch of Democrats and Republicans. So let's not be hoodwinked and bamboozled by the stratagems of a white ring uh, hunter in this country to undermine democracy. The moment we split citizen from voter, when you born in this country and you legitimate citizen, you ought to have the right to vote. That is the inheritance of the best of democracy. Now, I end by saying this. When voting first went into effect, women couldn't vote. Enslaved African people couldn't vote. Only if you were a property-owning white male did you have the possibility of voting. So when we fight for the release of unduly strictured laws against voting, it don't just help black people, it helps the masses of Americans. I'm for more people voting. I believe if you don't win this time, try it next time. Let me tell you what sore losers the right wing are. We didn't win. It must have been illegal. It must have been immoral. It must have had a trick. The fix is in. My team didn't win. The Philadelphia Eagles are 7-0. If they lose one time, the Philadelphians might go, it's the fix in. You know Jalen Hurts wasn't hurt. You know what happened there. J.A.J. Brown didn't do the damn thing. You're going to come up with a conspiracy theory. The right wing claims to love justice, but they hate justice. They hate democracy. They hate more people voting. And what you should do is demand the right for every citizen in this nation to have access to that voting. All right. Judge yeah, Brown, speaking, hold on, hold on, hold on, one second, one second. speaking of justice, because I want to get through this question. When you hear people respond to Black Lives Matter by saying all lives matter, what are your immediate thoughts? Freedom of speech. Okay. And I've been warning people about the fraud that BLM has been putting out there for a long time. See, I could buy whiskey and vote before the 60s were out. And I know what we did, all of the people that died, because it was dangerous being against the party lines back then. People shot you, not for robbing you, not for police using an excuse that you were a black man running, but because of your politics. And I know that there is a problem out there with what we are perceiving now. January 6th, it was deplorable, but there are 185 people. I saw that all the time back in the 60s when one college or high school got upset because their team didn't go to the bowl game. When I think of riots, I think of being in South Central in 1965 where they called out a division of the army to put it down and there are 15,000 armed troops out there to do it and you look from horizon to horizon if you turn around and everything's on fire. That's a riot. I think of take your booties to the pole. And when you start talking about voter suppression, are you trying to take that non-thinking group out there so you can manipulate them like they're sheep? The 
remember, I'm not on anybody's side. I'm independent. I just want to see effectiveness. I remember a client of my law office. He got cheated badly 22 years ago. His name Al Gore. He was client for our office. See, both sides do this. The Republicans did it then, and I don't care what anybody says. I saw some of the fraud up close and personal this last time. Where I live, with the voting machine totals coming out of the 14th largest city in America. Part of the game, but it needs to stop. And the voters need to be enlightened and educated and benefiting of a free press where you can hear everything, not just those things that pass an agenda. Now, I was a teaching assistant for a visiting professor way, way back when, and she said, America is in grave danger of becoming a fascist country not from some jackboot-wearing, goose-stepping, uniformed political thugs, but as she put it, from some long-haired beatniks who will impose the worst methods of fascism in the name of doing something for you. Read 1984, read Animal Farm, both by Orwell, if you want to get a line on it. It's dangerous. And I don't get it about people's sensitive feelings. I mean, I grew up when we used to run the dozens in elementary school, junior high, high school. Hey, man, I want to see nothing, man, but I was by your house last night, man, and your mama, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Hmm. Now they go, you talk about my mama, man. I said, Calm down. All an art form. But you see, Black Lives Matter is what I saw back then when everybody was trying to hustle. You had a lot of people who were sincere with what they were doing and some other ones that just said, let me pimp this cause, let me hustle this cause and see how much money I can get. Years later, I made some freedom of information request and oh yeah, I knew it back when. He was a snitch. He was an informant. He was an agent. I mean, one somebody I knew one time, uh, interesting, I knew him well. He was supposed to be a medic, just got back from the NOM. He was always helping folk out. Oh, every now and then, what we did, people would get injured. Some years later, I was in law school and I attended this murder trial to watch and they bring him out. I thought, oh, this dude's an informant. They said, no, this is Lieutenant Tackwood, long head of the counterintelligence section, special investigative services for Los Angeles Police Department. I said, oh, wow. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's a real thing. I went to a school where in broad daylight, two individuals I recruited to UCLA, John Huggins and Bunchy Carter from the Panther Party, got shot down in broad daylight. They hauled the acting chancellor of the University of California at Los Angeles, 68,000 students at the time, black guy, LAPD went over, stuck a shotgun in his back and escorted him across a mile of campus to handcuff him to a chair like he had something to do with it. Hell, they tried to kill me, put four bullet holes in the back of my chair where I was supposed to be, up in Campbell Hall, where we decided that we weren't getting taught what we needed, so we decided we're going to get taught that and we want the full panoply of instructions. So we imposed it. Now Campbell Hall's still there, but they moved the Minority Studies Department over to Bunch Hall, the largest building on UCLA's campus where they have more than 100,000 full-time students. It's a small city. But you go over there now, and these people who don't realize all the folk that died to get that department set up, 
They're sipping Chablis and nibbling crackers and talking about, you know, did you go see the play the other day? And Professor Crenshaw is over there who is uh, trying to get tenured and a roommate of mine, now a doctor, said, Joe, take a look at this. I said, I remember that. 1967, me, you, so-and-so, professor, so-and-so, and so-and-so, we came up with this black studies program. So take a look at this. I said, that's that critical race theory thing? It looks just like it, but there are some changes. We switched from get motivated, get angry, here are the buttons to push, this is how it works, these are your objectives, go do something about it. Now we switched over to everybody is so awful and we need to appeal to somebody to make it all right like somebody that's been jacking you over like a lot of crooks I dealt with over the last 50 years. They ain't going to change unless you make there some consequences to it. And if you don't deliver consequences to somebody when they aren't doing right, you're not getting anywhere. And see, I still think... Man, I've seen all of these presidents. I've been alive since Truman was president. Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy. We debated on whether Kennedy should be in LBJ. I met two of his children, by the way. He had, while he was president, one with the White House secretary and another one with a lady named Marie Brown who introduced me to her son and the other one, no relation. Then there was Tricky Dick Nixon, and one of my frat brothers ran against Tricky Dick. He was Hubert Humphrey, but he was in Alpha Phi Alpha. So Camilla Harris is not the first somebody in a black Greek organization to be vice president. Then let's see, there was Jerry Ford, met him, and then there was Jimmy Carter, met him, didn't read Ronald Reagan, but let's see, then there was uh, George W. Herbert Walker Bush. And let's see, he had an interesting first cousin who was the grandfather of the president after Nix. And then there was his father, George, um, his son, George W. Bush. And then his cousin, Barack Obama, through the mother became president. So we had George Herbert Walker Bush, who was first cousins to the grandfather of Barack Obama was president. I mean, it's kind of interesting picture when you look at the kin relationship and we're up here talking about fundamental evil and we're getting the family thing. I mean, for goodness sakes, let's wise up. All right, final question, and then we'll open it up for questions. <laughs> and we'll open it up for questions from the audience. Final question, Dr. Dyson. When you hear the phrase, and I quote, I get that black people were upset over George Floyd, but how is rioting helping the cause for improving black communities? First thing come to mind. Yeah, well, let me, um, I mean, the very entertaining uh, anecdote of uh, Judge Brown there in regard <laughs> Uh, just, just some fascinating uh, history going on there. But at the end of the damn day, right, at the end of the day, again, we know where the real crooks are. We know where the real criminals are. Because see, those folk that he's, you know, especially those in the hood, right, in the riding, so they're going to go to jail. They're going to serve their time. It's these ones out here who keep appealing to Judge Clarence Thomas by taxes from being seen by the Congress. It's the ones who appeal to the Supreme Court, Judge Roberts, to stay you know, certain things occurring. So again, I'm with the judge. I just think the cast of characters, the ones who is the real criminals, not who are, who is the real criminals, are the ones you see every day. Claiming it, and it ain't a bigger crook in this nation than Donald Trump in America, dog. He ain't, look, he, your pimp daddy, Don Juan, Bishop Don Juan Trump. I'm not a player, I just crush a lot. 
When the rim is in the system, ain't no telling will I love them, will I diss them. That's what they be yelling. I'm a pimp by blood. Not relay shown. Y'all still chase some, I'll replay some. Huh. Anyway. So, when we think about all lives matter and the judge says freedom of speech, you're absolutely right. But it's evident that white lives matter. You ain't got to say that. When Judge Joe Brown walks into a room, you can tell the man commands presence. He ain't got to announce he cold-blooded. He is cold-blooded. You say he's cold-blooded because you applaud for him. You acknowledge him. If he got to say it, you already lost the war. White lives are already evidently in mattering. Gabby Petrina, Petrina, right, right, right. Black woman go missing. Well, another sister gone. White woman, my God, Jiminy Cricket, what's going on? Let's get it done, right? What is the phenomenon of Karening in America? You hurt my feelings. I'm calling the cops. We know white lives matter. So when black folks say black lives matter, the implicit addendum, terminologically and linguistically, is two. Black lives matter, two. Black lives matter also. So we ain't trying, and look, and for, for being perfect, no, we know these organizations ain't perfect. They were Jack and Martin Luther King Jr. up in SNCC. They called him the law behind his back. That's the Black Lives Matter of that day. SNCC, and they were doing tremendous work. They went to Mississippi. They risked their lives. Robert Moses and all those folk went down there with Fannie Lou Hamer, and they risked their lives. So even though they weren't perfect, they were perfectly committed. As the great theologian Grace Jones said, I may not be perfect, but I'm perfect for you, <laughs> right? So the thing is, is that the, the Black Lives Matter of the day were dog and king, calling them the law. Why? Did, and partly they dogged him because he liked to have silk pajamas. Now here, here's a man who's given up his life. Here's a man who's preaching every day against hatred. Here's a man who made $240,000 back in 1961 and 62 and gave every dime except $6,000 to the movement. Here's a man who gave all of his book royalties to his, to his alma mater. An alma mater that wouldn't put him on the board of trustees until two and a half years before he died. Why? The white man who was the head of the board of trustees, Brother Merrill Lynch, Merrill Lynch, said that King was a poor role model. Why? Because he went to jail too often. Negro, he wasn't selling crack. He was trying to crack the edifice of white supremacy and Jim Crow in American society. Now, is Black Lives Matter perfect? No. Got a $6 million crib out in L.A.? What's up with that? I want the judge to stop by on his way back to the crib in L.A. I know where ask what's going on. I ain't lying. Now, here's the point, though. That ain't all of Black Lives Matter, though. Black Lives Matter was powerful because it represented our insistence after Trayvon Martin. Then with Mike Brown, and I'm going to get to George Floyd, give me one more minute. So the thing is, we said our lives matter. It began as a hashtag, it ended up as a movement. It was organic. It wasn't top down. It wasn't no astroturf like the Tea Party when you got a bunch of white elites manipulating the evangelical piety of ordinary citizens to try to make an end, to try to sanctify and legitimate and baptize their bigotry. No, it began with the cry from the heart of black people, dead gummit, we matter too. So, when you ask me now about what your question was? <laughs> George Floyd. Now, they say, and you said what? You said specifically about George Floyd, what? Black Lives Matter. Your thoughts. But here's my point, though. Here's my point. I thought you said something different, but let me look. George Floyd died. Now, we got Kanye. Hot diggity damn. Kanye's a friend of mine. I love him. But you listening to the right-wing documentary that told you he died from fentanyl, right, in his system. Now, here's my point. Judge Joe Brown, M Memphis, Tennessee. 
when on April 4th, 1968, at 6.01 p.m. local time, the greatest we've ever produced, I would argue, died. As one rapper said, the future took a headshot. A report rang out across a parking lot of a motel in Memphis, severing the tie and creating a gaping wound in the neck of a prophet named Martin Luther King Jr. When they did the autopsy, they discovered that due to smoking and eating, he had the heart of a 63-year-old man. Now I'm 64 now, I hope it wasn't that bad. But the point is this, did he die from arteriosclerosis or from smoking? Or did the mither freaking bullet that exploded inside of his neck kill him? George Floyd could have had a bunch of stuff in his body. It's already been scientifically deconstructed. But if you're going to go with that ignorance, the point is this. It is the pressure put by Derek Chauvin's knee on the neck of George Floyd and not treating him like a human being, disregarding his cry. I cannot breathe. He had a black man on his back, a white man on his neck, a white man on his torso, and an Asian man on the lookout. That was multiculturalism, proving that diversity without the notion of equality is empty. You have to have diversity toward justice. So yes, I say to all of those who uphold the value of American society, blue lives matter. First of all, ain't no parallel between blue lives and black lives. One is an ontological assessment. That's a big word to talk about how you born in your being black. Although we know it's political construction and fiction as James Baldwin said, but run with me for a minute. Blue is a profession, not a state of being. If you born blue, call the darn doctor because you ain't getting enough oxygen. But my point is that we have heard the excuses that people have made to try to justify assaulting black people. We have seen them build prisons based on area codes predicting what black people will and will not do. Yes, the judge is right. We should hold each other to account. But there's a bunch of white hooligans running around now who ain't going to never see the inside of a jail because white supremacy and white privilege will protect them. George Bush said he was a drunk until he was age 40. Now he became president of the United States of America. A lot of misbehaving white men out here doing a whole bunch of madness and they become president like Donald Trump. You thief. You bigot, you lugubrious leech, you apparition that steals the life and joy from democracy. Damn right, Black Lives Matter, and you can't say it enough because Black Lives Matter means America matters, and that's what we love. All right, all right, all right. We're gonna take a couple, we're gonna take a couple of quick questions from the audience. We have mics in the back. Folks, we want to hear from you. We're going to take a couple of questions from the audience. All right, right here. Got the mics. Looks like people are going to buy a doctor's book over here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Judge. I appreciate you, bro. All right. Right here. How are you? <clears throat> Excuse me. How are you? Um, Judge Joe Brown, I have a question for you. Do you support women in leadership? Well, Do you support women in leadership positions? Depends on now, what the leadership position wait a minute, wait a minute, is. Wait a minute. Now, the reason I ask that, because in a mayoral debate last Thursday in Memphis. Oh, let's get into that. On, I know on, what your question is. I'll explain it better than you can. Uh, if I'm allowed to ask the question, well, excuse me, I know what it is. If I'm allowed to ask the question, go ahead. I know what it's going to be. Though. For you then. Go ahead. I no. feel you through the force. <laughs> the reason I asked this is because you were quoted in a male debate in Memphis last week saying women can't lead.
because some of the places that they have to go to show leadership. That's a damn lie. That's not what I said. I, just, I knew you were going there if I can explain it. What I said was this. You didn't mm. allow me to go answer, ahead, go ask ahead. the question. Go ahead. Let me finish the question. Go ahead. I'm listening. Because mm. I understand some of the mm. most dangerous information is misinformation. Like what you said about um, Barack Obama's grandparents being related to Bush. But that's okay. That they would be raped some of the areas that they would had to go into to show leadership. Okay. Now, I knew what you were going to ask. Here's where the truth of the matter is. I crashed this meeting by the young Democrats. They didn't want me there because they were supporting people who had been throughout their careers ripping the people of Memphis off for personal gain. All right? Now, when I got there, I put this thing out. I said, if you're going to be the mayor, you have to get up close and personal with everybody in the city if you want to straighten them out. That means that the next mayor is going to have to go to places that are dangerous. When I was a criminal court judge, I walked in the hood, and I'd snatch somebody off the street. Then I tell you to be in at 10 o'clock? What time is it? It's 11.30. You see me tomorrow at 10 a.m. All right? Now, I said, in this day and time, when the mayor needs to get down into the people so he can go everywhere in the city and the people think that's our chieftain, we're going to protect him. He doesn't need the police or armed guards because he's ours. Okay? A woman who is a feminist, who is chairwoman of the Young Democrats, said, since there are black women that may run for mayor, why don't you withdraw and support one of them. Well, I don't know anybody you're talking about personally. What are their qualifications? I think that question is sexist. It's misogynist because it makes some presumptions about masculine superiority. And it's also racist. Now, the truth of the matter is, is I gave that woman an answer that a 19-year-old female college student, a young black woman, had given me not long before. She said, Judge, you are right, because if some of us go where you need to go, somebody's going to drag us off into a vacant apartment and do things to us. That's what she said. She was 19, and all I did was quote that. And I gave an explanation. I said, I don't have any objection to a woman holding an executive office. It's just right now, in 2022 and next year in 2023, there are some things that are going to have to be done that are in line with my remarks I made earlier tonight about you taking fatherhood out of the home, fatherhood out of the hood, and you need to put somebody back in, Daddy Brown, whatever it's going to be, and you need what only I can deliver to this city in terms of straightening it around. That's what I said. But it was taken out of context, so I've been a lifetime Democrat way before this young lady was born. But they attacked me just because I wanted to get some things right. And all I was saying is, it's uncomfortable. I even said, I, you know, I know this is going to make some of you uncomfortable, but it's an unfortunate reality of being alive in the United States of America and in Memphis, Shelby County, Tennessee. You know there are some places where you go at night, you get out to pump your gas, and you get to feeling nervous. Don't lie and say that isn't the case. I realize that. So I want to be the man that steps back out there and starts getting the young boys in line so they become productive citizens. Not a threat. Now... That was done so I could get somebody uh, out of the way of somebody that says the skyline in his downtown Memphis where he stands to make several tens of millions of dollars is more important than fixing the whole city up. Where somebody else is getting a play on $680 million converting a football arena into a soccer stadium. That's where somebody's got the crazy idea that they took down some Confederate statues and for $2,500, they got 30-some acres of public land in prime location. They can now do what they want to. That's where somebody 
sponsored one of the most ridiculous things I've ever seen of 25 acres in the exact center of downtown Memphis, $600,000. See, that's what I was talking about, and that is what this group was about, and they tried to do an ambush thing, and they lied about it. They quoted it out of context. It was supposed to be 150, 100 people there. There weren't but 23 people in the organization there. The rest of them were folk that were customers at this nightclub. And they were going right on, Judge, and people were running up to me to offer the campaign, including a lot of women. Now, my number one lawyer is a woman. There are several women that I know on federal appeal, appellate courts, federal, that I was mentor to, some of whom know what a woman is, unlike the current confirmed purpose person on the Supreme Court. And I have, let's see, a woman dentist, two women dentists, three women doctors, and a whole bunch that tell me what to do. And Miss Dana over here, who runs the real Dana that you can catch me on twice a week, she's all, tune in and see how we interact. But now, I don't have any problems with women being in charge, but sometimes a man's got to do what a man's got to do because it is the obligation of men to protect womanhood and promote manhood. And the best thing some man can do is sit your ass down and let a woman do the job. Well, it ain't that time now. All right, ne next question. All right, next now, question. <laughs> not in Memphis. It's my time. <laughs> All right, now next question. Go ahead. Okay. Good evening, um, Judge Brown and Dr. Dyson. I just have a, a quick question. As a matter of practicality in listening, I, I would imagine many of us for decades about the problems that plague the land of our community. So in terms of where we are right now, I'm a working person, a woman, and what can I do right where I am to change the landscape of my community. We know that many of the problems are systemic and it will take another you know, 40 or 50 decades to infiltrate that because we have to dissolve it and then replace it with something. So in, in the interim, what do I do right where I am? Dr. Dice. Yeah, well, look, obviously you plan a long game got to have patience. The right wing after Roe versus Wade, what, 73? They've been waiting until they got enough folk on the Supreme Court to do what they want to do. So they had some kind of ethical patience and moral deferment in order to realize an objective, right? That's number one. Number two, clearly being a highly articulate, intelligent black woman, you got to bloom where you planted. Rear your children if you're a mother. Continue to nurture them into adulthood. If you have a partner, male or female, I'm not speaking of you specifically, I'm saying whoever. Because part of the problem is toxic masculinity and the inability to imagine that another partner is not just, I hear what the judge is saying, I'm a black man, I'm, I'm 64 years old. I came up out the hood in Detroit. I understood the systemic displacement of black men through welfare policies that punished the presence of black men, but also stigmatized the presence of black women, right? 1965, the Moynihan Report talked about, warned about the coming matriarchy. Now, wait a minute now. Now, men being systemically disappeared is one thing, but demonizing the women who stayed? The kids get mad at the mama. I'm mad at you because daddy gone. The Negro left. Disappeared. Too tough for him or forced out. I'm not trying to give any judgment, but I'm saying I stayed. The black woman stayed. The, 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 the prodigal son went off. But the brother or sister who stayed at home preparing your meals, making sure you got up on time, sending your butt to college. So what I'm saying to you Part of the problem is 
that you, as an intelligent black woman looking at the political landscape, understanding the necessity of partnering with and forging alliances with other black people and other people of conscience, other white brothers and sisters, other lesbian sisters, other non-binary people, what we have to do is to police the ethical erosion and the moral insensitivity in our own communities. I, I, go to, I went to a black church the other day, a black woman said, well, other year, black woman said two years ago, three years ago, she said, you know you're going to hell. I said, well, damn, did Jesus tell you that? Because I just spoke to him this morning and he ain't mentioned no flames. He said, you know why you're going to hell? Because you said that God created gay people. I said, baby, you think I'm going to hell? And you are polytheist, obviously. You believe there's a God for straight people and a God for gay people. Either God made everybody or God ain't made nobody. It ain't no in between. What? God took a break on Wednesday. You know, creating these people is too hard. I need a break. So the second shift God came in and created gay people, that's what the white man said about you as a black person. You are incapable of moral sensitivity. You are not human. And the government that they erected determined that their theology, which was distorted, would be reflected in their sociality. Black people don't need to replicate the same madness, bigotry, and hatred of the other. I ain't never been to a black church that turns down gay ties. They ain't kicking no people out to choir either. Quiet as it's kept, you wouldn't get no Sunday morning sermon in some instances if you didn't have a gay person in the pulpit. Don't make me go there. Don't make me tell you the truth. So I'm saying, why do we turn around and practice the same kind of moral decrepitude, the ethical insensitivity of trying to demonize people and genderize our approach? I agree with the judge on this. Let the best man do the job. And often it's a woman. And let that woman step up and step forward. The women that I know in life are the ones who defend black men more than anybody else. The greatest defenders of black men are black women. It's about time that black men stepped up to the plate, supported black women, and made sure that they were comfortable and that they were creative in their own minds and hearts because they have sacrificed so much to create us. It ain't just the rappers calling a woman a bitch or a hoe or a skeezer or a slut. It's judges and doctors and lawyers and philosophers who are trying to romanticize their position as men. Stop that bullshit and let the real tragedy of hatred fall to the side and let women become the full creatures that God created them to be. That's what we need to have. All right. Ma'am, in answer to your question specifically, you seem articulate. Why don't you run for political office and take the involvement that you have indicated that you wish to put into the subject, get yourself really knowledgeable, and 50 years ago it took about six weeks for something to become a fad in America. Make it so, and this time make the fad a good one. Now, toxic masculinity, that's part of this problem that we have that is a myth that is trying to put black people in the same basket with uh, those people who aren't into something others of us are into. That's their right. But it's specious, and what they call toxic masculinity is the absence of masculinity. That's the problem. And I'll give you an example about black men supporting families. Thirty years worth of going to judicial conferences where we study this, every year we have to take 16 unit hours, college unit hours, to keep up. And guess which demographic in all of America pays its child support most regularly and on time? Mm -hmm. Black men. For the last 40 years that they've been keeping the stats, the demographic that pays its child support on time in the amounts ordered are black men. 
But that's not the myth. That's why Jesse, by the way, said that thing about Obama in 2007 at that Father's Day affair in um, Chicago uh-huh. when he said he needs his balls cut off because Reverend Jackson and I had ridden for four hours right next to each other on an airplane on a flight and he was well aware of that too and I had discussed it and as a matter of fact I'd showed him the latest figures that I'd gotten from the Tennessee Judicial Conference on that and we went over it and when the individual that was the guest speaker said my good brothers we're the worst in the country when it comes to paying child support that's what prompted that remark because we are not and if you think we are bad, you should see what all the rest of the demographics are doing relative to paying child support on time and in the amount specified. And when I first started practicing law 50-some years ago, the number one case I got doing poverty law was the check got cut off because one of the three or four or five or six baby daddies involved in the household was trying to be an actual father check got cut off and we had to get it cut back on. A lot of these people who were involved didn't run off and leave somebody. They were listening to, oh, what's her name? Nikki Giovanni, the poet. She came to UCLA in 1968 and she was saying that you don't need a father. The worst thing that can happen is to have a child with a father in his life. So Go find somebody to get pregnant by, have the baby, and then don't tell the fool that he's the dad. And we told her she was full of it. That was 55 years ago. And you can see it now. So there are some that leave. But there are some that just became the mechanism for somebody getting a check, not to support her children, but to support her. So, ladies, you need to talk to those young women and tell them that's not the case. I think of a family I had in my courtroom. I had a 57-year-old woman charged with felony drug and theft defenses. She ran a crack house, and she was a booster. Her 43-year-old daughter was in my courtroom. Her, get this. 34-year-old granddaughter to the 43-year-old who had had her one week shy of her 10th birthday was in my courtroom. The 34-year-old had a 21-year-old daughter in my courtroom. The 21-year-old daughter had an 11-year-old daughter pregnant with her second child. Astonishing mess. And who is at fault for that? Not the folk that are talking about character and decency, not the people that are preaching the hard sermons from their pulpits. And by the way, Reverend, correct me if I'm wrong, doesn't the book itself speak on that? I think there are some things in there, some passages about how people are supposed to behave so it always struck me as a little strange i had an uncle that was a preacher i had a grandfather that was a bishop took kojic from memphis to kansas city back in 1896 i think and they always taught me that the book is the book and that's the guide book and when somebody deviates from that guide book somebody's going way wrong now if you don't Go the way a lot of us go. That's your business. Get your freak on in the bedroom. I don't care. Enjoy yourself. (laughs) But uh, the book is the book. The word is the word. We're trying to recruit those children. All right. On that note, uh, final question. Final question. Go ahead. Just very briefly. Very briefly. Very (laughs) briefly. Yeah, the book is the book, all right, because the book was manipulated. We all know that. The house calls, right? Slaves obey your master. Children obey your father. Women obey your... If you that dude, it's all great. Because you're a slave owner, you're a husband, and you're a father. 
patriarchy was stitched into the very fabric of the book itself. So as a result of that, in subsequent revisions through the language of divine inspiration, there were passages that were created. Uh, Reverend Judge Brown is right. That the book has been the book to justify and legitimate all forms of racism, of sexism, of homophobia and patriarchy. You can justify killing. They got it all up in the book. But the book portrays the consequences of our finite apprehension of an eternal God. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. So ultimately, Jesus said it comes down to this. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, and soul. And love thy... That's the book. And if you try to justify hating on your neighbor who happens to be a woman, toxic masculinity ain't about... Because I, I agree with the judge in terms of some of the strategies that were deployed in terms of public policy to prevent and to exclude black men. It's horrible. I've named it already. Toxic masculinity is trying to justify and legitimate your sexist viewpoint that elevates masculine ideals above human ideas and above female ideas and trying to exclude women for no other reason than that they are women. That's what I mean by toxic masculinity. And it's so poisonous that it poisons the streams of our theology, sociology, and philosophy. So I'm with you. I think more churches need to pipe up and talk about sin, the sin of self-righteousness, the sin of hating the other, the sin of refusing to look at another human being and see them reflected in love. My religion is love. If you love your neighbor, you can be a white evangelical who hates black people and gay people and Jews, and you can be an atheist who loves black people, Jews, and others, and I'm down with you because I think God resides in those who ultimately understand the necessity of self-sacrificing love for the benefit of the entire community. So there is toxic masculinity, and it's in the pulpit. It's in the presidency. It's in the Senate. And we got to wipe that crap out and allow all human beings to stand up and be represented. And God knows when we look at what women have done with their backs against the wall, with fewer resources, they've been able to turn this thing around. If a woman was running this joint, I think it would be far better, far more humane, and far more capable of dealing with what we understand democracy to be. So I just got to put that word in it. My mama was a woman. My mama is a woman. And that, that judge, by the way, on the Supreme Court, refused to answer those questions of the Sadducee and Pharisee of the senator asking, what is a woman? You know what a woman is. A woman is whatever God made a woman to be. So when you talk about now we have biologically deterministic conceptions of women and we want to deconstruct that. And when now men become women and because they can have wounds. Asking that question is an attempt to trick. It's not an attempt to serve. It's not an attempt to illuminate. It's not an attempt to talk about the complexity and nuance of sexuality. It's about putting people down. And if you black in America and you've been crapped on, why you want to turn around and crap on anybody else? That's what we ought to understand. Now go on and ask your question, sir. I just had to <laughs> all say right, that. All right. So final, final question and then we'll Preacher, move into... Wasn't that a woman that asked another woman that question? What is a woman? It was Marsha Blackburn, the senator I, from. She wasn't a she woman. She was like a, a senator. Me. Well, she was she, a senator motivated by political she ideology. Like a woman to me, or is that more that faking it? You know, and not, you not can't that tell anymore. Gentlemen, but, gentlemen, but gentlemen, it was gentlemen, a woman. It was gentlemen. a woman who responded, and now she sits on the Supreme Court. Yeah, he got look at Clarence Thomas. He gentlemen. sits on the Supreme Court too. God does make much no. Okay. Gentlemen, gentlemen. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, gentlemen, we're going to move to our final I question. I agree, that was not a good move, but he is what he is. Judge Brown, Judge Brown, we're going to move, Judge Brown, we're going to move to our final question, and we'll go into final thoughts. Right. Next question. Thank you. 1991, as a young eighth grader, watching the world unfold before him, the story that year was appointment of the justice that will replace Thurgood Marshall or Big. And I remember not understanding, not understanding why we were in a situation where a black woman step out and speak against a black man trying to ascend. 
little did I know as an eighth grader that a seed was being planted, a poison seed that would eventually unfold to bear some wicked fruit. Today, that judge, Clarence Thomas, has been weaponized to the point where a former president intentionally files suits to go to his district or to his region of the country because he knows that a likely outcome would be in his favor. These days, a lot of conversation is going on with changing the makeup of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is, is the highest court in the land. It's supposed to be neutral. It hasn't been neutral in a long time. What are your thoughts, especially you, Judge Brown, because the judiciary is your area, but what are your thoughts on potential in the makeup of the Supreme Court? In fact, even, even to the point where they refer to it as court stacking, adding seats to the bench, or, or doing something to, to level the playing field so that not just the right or the left, but the United States of America as a whole has a more equal chance to survive. Judge Brown, your thoughts on the Supreme Court? All right. My thoughts on the appellate bench are that too many judges, justices are in place who have never dealt with people law. They have dealt with commercial interests. They have dealt with corporations. They've dealt with things from the perspective of an academic, but they do not have any real-world common sense. Too many of them have insufficient experience in the law. I look at one situation where there is a woman right now on a court of appeals who put her husband through law school had three children, she went to law school, she graduated, she took the bar, turned 30, she passed the bar four days after she was sworn into the bar, the governor appointed her a superior court judge with unlimited trial jurisdiction. So she had never set foot in a courtroom until the day she showed up as a judge. A president of the United States appointed her to the Western District of Tennessee as a federal judge less than two years out of law school. That person now sits on a federal appellate court. And that individual learned over years and decades at the expense of the people. I actually lectured one time to several members of the U.S. Supreme Court down here in D.C. when they had a judicial conference for the Second Judicial Circuit. All right, that said, you have to look at the big picture. Clarence Thomas took Thurgood Marshall's position. I admit the great justice. And I remember when he had his retirement ceremony, he was asked a question by the press. Justice, do you know who your replacement is? He had a real deep gravity for his, I know who that's going to be, but it wouldn't be ethical for me to comment. But let me just say this. A black snake will bite you just as quick as a white one. Now, Clarence Thomas went to Yale. They tried to recruit me to Yale some years before he went in there so they could set up the parameters for a minority admissions program. He was literally the last person admitted to Yale Law School for that year's class. We had been trying to do some things about maintaining affirmative action, but they sent Clarence Thomas around after he didn't do too well his first year in law school. And that whole summer, he spoke against affirmative action. A professor miraculously discovered that he had entered the wrong grade, so he stayed. So for the following two summers, every year, he'd go around and talk against affirmative action. Well, he got out. He didn't have to take the bar because the state he was in accepted a Yale 
degree in law is something that did not require a bar uh, exam passage. So he worked in the tax department for a state attorney general's office and every week they sent him around the country to speak against affirmative action. When the Reagan administration got in, they appointed him as head of Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. I had worked for the EEOC folk and they were doing some good work. His job was to destroy that agency. He couldn't, but he tried. And he had never been in a courtroom ever as a lawyer. I would met Anita Hill. I've had long discussions with her years ago here in D.C. I think she was right on point and exact about what she was saying. But then, as a reward, they nominated him for the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. She told me, the FBI came in to do a background check. I said, what? It's just an appellate court. He can't do but so much harm. I didn't have anything to say. When they nominated him for the U.S. Supreme Court, they asked me, and at first I said, no, I don't have anything. Said, Wait a minute, that's the U.S. Supreme Court. And what she said was exactly true about him. But that's an example of somebody with an agenda trying to appoint somebody that they can sneak that agenda through, and that's not good. Now, as I said, I'm an independent. I'm not Republican or Democrat. And the Republicans are guilty of a whole lot of sins. So are the Democrats. And you must keep in mind when you look at the long-term picture, 1851, the Republican Party was incorporated to deal with abolition, ending slavery, and keeping it spread down and not getting out west. Second decade of the 19th century, the Democrats were incorporated their express purpose in their articles of incorporation was to protect and spread slavery. So my grandfather never understood how a black person could support the Democrats. My parents were ambivalent and for the first 35, 40 years of my life, I couldn't understand how anybody could even think about a Republican. So they switch. Dixiecrats went with the Republicans. Now things have flopped back around. So quit thinking about somebody owns you. They don't. Be independent and vote where you get the most return. Gentlemen, final thoughts, one minute apiece. Starting with Dr. Dyson, final thoughts. Look, we are a, a nation under assault democracy is in peril and black people have historically been the bellwether and the benchmark for the best and the brightest ideas to emerge so as horrible as things are now this ain't the worst they've been judges refer to reconstruction enslavement we've suffered great blows to the body politic and yet at our best we uplift the virtue of creating a society where all human beings can thrive, regardless of their race, their ethnicity, their gender, their sexuality. Let's create the very thing we want to see come into existence. As black people, we don't want to be mistreated. We don't want to be told that we're not competent or capable. We don't want to, we don't want to be told that we have to accept the Supreme Court justice whose manifest mediocrity, the recipient of the very principle he will now vote against in a few days of affirmative action. And affirmative action doesn't mean that you ain't capable or competent. It means that white supremacy was so deep that it disallowed you to flourish. Michael Jordan wouldn't play in the NBA without affirmative action. Jackie Robinson without affirmative action. Affirmative action means that we allow people of tremendous substance to participate in formerly segregated arenas. So since we have been a victim of that, I beg and plead with you, let us allow men, women, boys, children, girls to come together in our communities seeking justice, seeking love. Justice is what love sounds like 
when it speaks in public. And if we want to translate our ability to love, we've got to talk about justice. That's for all people, not just for some, not just for our folk, but for all human beings. And thank you so much for allowing us to come up into your office here tonight. Dr. Brown, final thoughts. I'm not the one pushing a party agenda. I don't think you should belong to either party. You belong to yourself. And don't get all caught up in all of the phrases. Just think about what happens. And by the way, it ain't about black, white, brown, red, yellow. We all came out of Mother Africa. Some of us went to Europe and got mighty pale. Some of us went to Asia, got yellow. Some went from Asia to America, got red. Some came back around and got brown. But we're all human beings, and we all have a lot in us. And if you want to see what you have in you, get a DNA test, you might be surprised. The average white person in America has about a quarter of their genetics that come from recent African ancestors. And the average black person has that or more in them uh, that came from white ancestry. And interestingly enough, those who come from the South have a high percentage of Chinese because they brought in coolies to work on the Southern Railroads after the Civil War. And they didn't bring any Chinese women over and there were ex-slave women. And a lot of us have all kinds of things up in us. And some of us are Native Americans, though. A lot of folk want to act like that isn't the case, but there are all kinds of things out there. So we all came back around. Let's act like we're humans and let's pull together because if we don't, we have hell to pay. And I think if we don't get it together, you might teach your grandchildren that they need to study Mandarin Chinese because somebody else is going to be on top of the heap going to be the Chinese and the Russians followed by India and Pakistan and we're going to be where Great Britain was in 1945 once at the top now third rate so if you don't want that to happen get your act together and stop getting responsive to all of these catchphrases about who's doing wrong who's doing right and just figure out what the advantages are in the calculus of who's doing what for who Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our program. Give it up for Michael Eric Dyson and Judge Joe Brown. Applause for us is applause for yourself. There you go. Also give it up for our great host, Brandon Bryce. Great job. Thank you for coming. Make sure you check in and like us on social media, uh, Facebook and Instagram. Have a wonderful evening and a safe trip home.